Broadcasting from the Black Licorice Studio in London, Ontario, Canada. Welcome. I'm Kevin Bolmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man. This episode is presented by Mulligan Realty Group, Provincial Glass and Mirror, MyRealSuccess.ca, and NSM Brand Media. I'm excited to introduce you to Louis Engel today. Louis is somebody that I connected to on one of the socials. I can't even remember which. Maybe he'll remember. I want to say Instagram, but we've interacted a little bit on LinkedIn as well. And he's an example of the kind of person where I've just picked up a vibe where I thought, I really like what that person is doing. I, I love the energy and the vibe that's coming off them. I love the sense of contribution and encouragement and community that, that I feel from them. And I wonder if they would talk to me so that I can share them with you. And that's what we're going to do in just a couple of moments with Louis. He's a creative entrepreneur to give you a little bit of background before we bring him on. He works hard at a number of things, including being the project manager and the show host of Go Produce, which is a podcast where he interviews music industry professionals to figure out how they've turned their passion into profit because that's what he wants to do. See, that's a really neat hack, isn't it? And here's an insider tip for you if you're thinking about creating content. Maybe you want to learn how to become a multi-millionaire investor. Start a podcast on it and interview those people and you'll learn from them. See, Lou's got one of these right here. Um, he wants to know about how to turn his passion into profit in the music industry. And so he's had some terrific conversations about just that with music industry insiders on his podcast, Go Produce. He's also the CEO of the Big Lou Crew, where he makes happy rap music for his crew. And I guess the first question that I want to ask you, Louie, is how would you characterize happy rap music? What's happy rap music? Happy rap music. All right. So firstly, I'd like to say that hip hop and rap usually has a very negative connotation to it. A lot of people will think rap. Oh, I can't necessarily relate to it because it's not what my group of people are listening to. And I don't really like that divide. I come from the Caribbean, so I've got a lot of different kinds of combinations of musical flavors that come in and, and just amalgamate, if you will. And so I wanted to take the concept of rap because it's such a beautiful form of communication and attach it to something that can be always perceived as happy. And I don't want to just be like delusional and say everything is happy. You can only be happy. I do embrace all emotion across the board, but I want to take things and frame them in a perspective in such a way that it is happy. And I want to do so with uplifting motivational music, have tropical dance vibes included in it as well. Uh, my mom's from South America, so I want to have that Latino influence as well. And see what I can do, see what I can do. Have some people, as you mentioned, community-wise, I wanna focus on making sure that everyone is included. So, so I'm Big Lou, I make happy rap music. I, I believe in community and respect and I want everyone to feel welcome with this kind of music. I love how that sounds. I wanna hear some already. And I'm curious <laughs> about what was the spark? What, in, what comes to mind of your initial interest in music that got all this brewing? I have a very odd story, actually. I, I started to, uh, to pursue a career as a motivational speaker at around 26 years old, and that involved me quitting my job as a server and starting a YouTube channel with no real plan. And, and as I was spending a lot of time building different scripts and, and trying to develop my keynote, I found that I was most irritated when I had to turn off the music so that I can rehearse my skits or, or my speeches, whatever, into the mirror or, or, or however I was practicing at the time. And I thought one day, why not just write to a beat? I not once in my life did I think, hey, I'm gonna become an artist. But after I did have that little aha moment of maybe I'm gonna write to this beat, I told myself, let me take the challenge of writing a verse every single day for 30 days. And this was two days after I wrote the first verse, which I actually learned how to do by doing some research on YouTube. Uh, I came across a video. It was an 11 minute video and it said, or it, it taught you how to write a verse in hip hop. And within 15 minutes, I had my first verse. And so I was like, okay, it can't be that simple. Let me, let me challenge myself more, which is where the 30 day challenge came in. And that was the moment I was like, I know I want to be in communication. I know I want to touch as many people as I can. I know I have to focus on myself in order to do that. So I can channel my emotions, my thought process and everything through these raps and then hopefully connect with other people in the process. I love how you said it can't be that simple, but 
a lot of things often are, aren't they? It's just that we don't ever allow ourselves to get started into them. And that's exactly what it was because other people would regard it as something more challenging. If it's so simple for you, you should probably explore it a little bit further. That's, that might be your mm. niche, you know? Mm. That's interesting. <laughs> what was that initial verse about? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, I couldn't, I, off the top of my head, the first one I couldn't remember, but I do remember probably one of the first three was I'm sitting here at my desk. I'm not too sure what I want to talk about. Looking at the door. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is a year and a half. Okay. So it was, it was a verse that was so bad, embarrassingly, painfully bad that I never actually rehearsed it, but it was literally just me talking about the environment that I was in sitting in my basement room, not really knowing what I want to talk about as a rapper. Um, and the fact that I'm still going to do it. There's an episode of the Simpsons, which I stopped watching a long time ago. My kids used to be really into it. So I'd watch it with them Yeah, where Homer is going along and he's singing. He goes, I'm singing what I'm thinking. Hey, look at that dog. <laughs> and I'm like, that's what Louie's talking exactly, about. Exactly. He's just like narrating his experience and then doing it to a beat. It was so preposterous, but that's how you start, I suppose. I was just going to say, that's where you start. Like Chris Gardner says, you start where you are and the way to get good is to be bad and keep working on it, right? Yep. So where did it catch for you where you thought that might have been bad, but I could see where it has the potential to get better and I'm actually enjoying this. I want to keep doing it. What, what, where did you, if you did at all, get that sense of momentum picking up? Well, I, after I wrote the 30, song, uh, 30 verses, I began challenging myself to write actual full songs. So instead of actually studying rap technique, I started looking at song structure. I started studying the history of it. Why are people listening to shorter songs? Why are there two hooks? Different, different variables to, to building an actual song. And then I wrote some songs to that. And I showed a select few people that at the time didn't necessarily consider me to be a rapper because I didn't necessarily consider myself to be a rapper then. Um, but I would get their feedback and nine out of 10 times, they'd be like, that's pretty good. <laughs> so that got to me and it was the small little wins, not necessarily other people affirming that they liked what I was putting out because the product is, is nowhere near finished. If you ask any artist, they want to put out their final products usually. Um, but these small affirmations and then me hearing myself over and then comparing it to other people, not necessarily the, the content or the context that we're talking about, but timing and, 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 and energy essentially is what I was focusing on. Once I realized I was focusing on that kind of stuff, I knew I had to, I had to commit more because it's where my subconscious thoughts were leading me. I love everything about this story so far, Louis. Um, <laughs> you are... If I heard you right, you said that you were 26 when you left your job as a server. So at the time that you're doing all this, you're in your mid to late 20s, correct? Yeah, I'm 29 today. So you didn't grow up thinking I'm going to be a musician and, and media personality or anything like that. You, this just kind of found you. Zero. Yeah. See, if, if you spoke to 25-year-old me, I would have told you that I'm not a creative individual at all. What would 25-year-old you have said that you thought you would be doing with the rest of your life? 25 year old me was insanely lost. Hmm. I was, I was, I was in a big rut. I was working in the service industry a lot, um, bartending, serving. And I was also trying to get permanent residency at the time. So I was back in school or sorry, no, I wasn't back in school. Then I was, I went back to school at a period of time for pharmaceutical studies so that I can get a job in my like background, which was biology so that I can then apply for permanent residency. So I was in a, in, a, in a very not long-term headspace. I was, I need to get permanent residency so I don't get kicked out of the country. Yeah. And now you're a happy rapper and a podcast host. Yes. Yes. It's <laughs> super bizarre how that turned, but around that time I was, I was gearing up to if permanent residency didn't work out, we're done with Canada. It was kind of bizarre at that point in time. We can maybe come back to the, the permanent residency thing. I, I, I think I'd like to hear more about that. And it yeah. sounds like it's a, 
uh, an important part of the, the story because it sounds like it was a bit of a shadow hanging over top of some of these decisions before we yeah. go there. Yeah. <laughs> you just gave the cartoon sound effect for the bomb dropping from the, <laughs> from the plane. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. First, I'd like to go back to the point in the story where you mentioned that you wanted to be a motivational speaker. I love this because what I have found in my experience, Louis, is moving forward is moving forward, that, that goals aren't to define us. They're to help us move forward and to help us grow. And sometimes the thing that we, we start moving forward toward doesn't end up being the destination that we were meant for, but it moves us to use an analogy down the hallway where we can see the other open door. Yeah. You described just a little bit about being kind of bummed out when you'd have to stop the music that was introducing you. Uh, and it sounds like you, you were more interested. You, you just, you had an intuitive sense maybe that, that the music actually interested you more than the mechanics of the speech. But what more can you tell me about that? that whole thing, because you, it sounded to me like you were pretty serious about, I'm going to go down this path, the speaking, but then this one element of it, I think I like better. So to hell with this other one, <laughs> I'm going to follow yeah. the thing that gives me a charge. Tell me more about that. What was going on there? It was, it was a little bit of a bizarre experience. I, I, I fully committed to the, the, the motivational speaking route. I, I actually hired a, a speaking coach. And you're familiar with her, Miss Sarah Hilton. Uh -huh. And uh, we did some good work for about half a year. And that's where I spent some more time building out the keynotes. And actually, she helped me very much frame the idea of delivering a story, but through speech, while also engaging. Um, I'm, I'm also part of Toastmasters, so they helped kind of influence that. And that's where the idea of motivational speaking even actually started. Then I approached Sarah Hilton. Um, but I don't want to say it was a drag, the motivational speaking, because I definitely do still want to continue with that. I just don't want it to be my main focus, if, 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 if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, through my music, I still want to go around and, and perform. But then perhaps during the day or in the evening or on an off day as I'm touring, I can actually still give speeches at the universities or at different businesses, different communities, whatever the case may be. Um, but I found that I was better equipped to communicate through music because I also thought that I was receiving a message from the song and then almost conveying it or omitting it in a different way that other people could understand it through word. And oftentimes through my speeches, I would receive feedback. Oh, that was super catchy. That specific tagline, this and that tagline. And those usually hacken, hacken. Those usually occur off the cusp. So if I'm able to spend some time ahead of time. Oh, one second. I'm in a podcast. <laughs> um, if I'm able to do that ahead of time and, and, put all of these clever sayings together in a melodic rhythm, then I think it'll be even more catchier and have greater impact. So that's why I went to the music route. See, I was just going to say what you learned from Sarah and the experience that you gained by Toastmasters and other engagements where you were up in front of people will always serve you well. But before I even had the opportunity to do that, you get interrupted. <laughs> in the middle of your own interview and yeah. you managed to handle that without losing your train of thought. So you're already proven the point, but it I wanted to add, <laughs> well done, Louie. I wanted to add, or ask you again about that pivot because I hope that people who are listening and watching to this or watching this will remember that for their own journey, because I think so many of us are hesitant to let go of something once we have started down a certain path, even if our intuition is telling us to, to maybe take the fork in the road, that it's okay, that sometimes what gets us moving forward isn't the, the path that we ultimately take. Um, and like, like you said, ultimately, speaking and, and being in front of people is going to continue to be part of what you do. It, it, it's being that right now, and it is as the host of a podcast and, and yeah. whatnot. But to trust yourself enough to, to, to maybe let things go, even temporarily, and to recognize that that intuitive sense of what lights you up and to follow that sounds like that's what happened with you. 
it's true. And, and, and to add to that, to make it a little bit even, even more dramatic, I did actually quiver at the idea of one, moving away from motivational speaking because I, I already invested time into it, but also I was committed to my coach. Like, hey, we set some goals, this and this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And she was putting in work to it as well. So I was like, mm-hmm. am I rude for doing this to her? But essentially, that's not how it is. It's what are you doing for yourself to help yourself and to those around you? And had I continued, I don't think I would be where I am today. But, but I wouldn't be where I am today had I not spent the time I did there. Absolutely. You mentioned a lot of good things. Um, that other aspect of when you're invested and you feel like you, you can't put something down because you're invested. That's a trap that, that kept me, it kept a hold of me <laughs> for a lot of things in my life. One of the analogies, Louis, that a friend of mine used um, one time that I never forgot was, uh, I call it, put the book down. Remember, we used to be sitting and chatting after a session at the gym, and I'd be complaining about this book I was reading that I just wasn't liking it, and it was a real slog to get through it. And he said, why don't you just put the book down? And so, well, I can't do that. Well, why not? Well, I bought it. Yeah. You know, I started it. I'm like invested in it. I feel like I need to see it through. He says to me, well, can I ask you a question? What are you reading it for? And I go, enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, and how are you enjoying it? Like, I'm not. He goes, why don't you put the book down? And as silly as that sounds, I wonder if um, that doesn't trap a lot of us, even in careers that make us miserable, because there's a version of that I think I heard from you, both in terms of the investment that you put in yourself and in Sarah. Um, But we never completely close those chapters, do we? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think they're always, always going to be a part of your life. And and you're always going to think back whenever you have similar situations arising to those scenarios and you, you can't, you can't, you can't go on thinking, Hey, what if I didn't do that? Because why spend your time doing that ultimately? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the residency thing. Residency. Um, being concerned that you're going to get kicked out of the country that you're living in must be a bit of an emotional burden to bear. Tell me about it. Yeah. It was kind of bizarre. I actually came to Canada in 2006 when I was three days before my 15th birthday and I did boarding school. So I'm not like new to Canada. And at this point in time, that would have been about 10 years later where I was struggling to get permanent residency. I don't want to say like I'm blaming anyone. I made a couple of mistakes. Um, The website crashed a couple of times, hiccups here and there, but Ultimately, it took me approximately 11 years to get permanent residency, where some people can get it in six months, some people get it in four years. I don't know. I'm not, it, it took me quite a long time to do it. And throughout that experience, I had to leave the country twice, knowing I'd come back, just not too sure when. And then the final time was, I was 20. Okay, so I just turned 26, and I was finishing up my year at the pharmaceutical industry where I had to accrue enough hours to then apply for permanent residency, right? So my permit expired in February of 2018. And at that point I had accrued enough hours and I just put together my permanent residency application and I submitted it, but I couldn't stay in the country working anymore because my permit expired. So I went home for an indefinite period of time. I wasn't certain if they would say yes, they being whoever decided to review my application because it is one person and and it's their mood sometimes, but it worked out. I was home for about five months for the summer of 2018, which was an experience in itself. We can, we can dive a little bit further into that, but I got my permanent residency, August, 2018. I returned. I did the serving thing for another year because I was familiar with that. I needed cash. I was already in debt because of the lawyer fees, not being working, all of that, whatever, whatever. Um, 
And that's the year that I started Toastmasters. I started doing personal development reading kind of stuff. Um, 2019, I, I found Sarah and jumped further into that. And then August, I began the raps. So the permanent residency in itself was emotional roller coaster because I couldn't really plan ahead of time for a future because I didn't know if my future was going to be here in Canada or back home. I had forces saying, oh, yeah, you can come home and do this and this and this, you know, parental forces here and there, friends that are doing this and that with their lives. And they're like, oh, it'd be cool if you're here. And yeah, I know it'd be cool, but I also want to do other things. I just don't necessarily know what I want to do. Um, so that was a bit of a conflict internally. And, and I guess I do, I do wear my emotions on my face. It's a weakness and a strength, but it would affect other people around me as well. So that was a bit of a struggle. Please forgive me. You mentioned earlier where home is. And yeah, it's, it's I didn't slipped specify. St. Martin, St. Martin. Okay. Tiny, tiny island in the Caribbean. Fun fact about St. Martin. It's the sixth smallest landmass in the world divided by two countries, the Dutch and the French. What was it that, that brought you from there to Canada in the first place? Ooh, this was my parents' decision. <laughs> I had no interest, at least how I recall it, in leaving the comfortable, warm beach environment and going into snow. At this point in time, I'd, I'd never even seen snow. Um, so I, didn't, I wasn't fond of the idea of heading out. But coincidentally, my best friend at the time was also being sent off to deporting or deport to uh, uh, to boarding school. And I'm saying it's like it's a horrible situation. We were actually very fortunate to, to do this in the end. But it was my parents who, who, who wanted more opportunity for us. And we ended up applying for different bursaries and scholarships. And, and one of them worked out. Well, this story just keeps getting more interesting, Louis. <laughs> Tell me what it was like when you first got here. What time of the, first of all, what season were we in? What time of the year was it when you got to Canada? August 28th, 2006. Okay. So it's not so bad, right? You not land so in, bad. You not land so in bad. August and you're like, hey. Yeah. Not so bad at all. Um, um, you wear a nice light sweater during the evenings. That was In August? <laughs> yeah. We're, so St. Martin, the cold nights are like 21 degrees at okay. night. <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> Had you seen snow before? Had you experienced it firsthand? No, that was coming to Canada was the first time I had that. So what was that like the first winter? I was, I was fond of it, but also fed up with it. <laughs> More so. Fond you sound of like it. every Canadian too. I know. I know. Right up it's, until Christmas and then way, every day way. after Christmas. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. Actually, funny enough, Christmas time. So I'll tell you the story real quick about, my first time seeing snow and then Christmas with snow. Okay. Um, but the first time I saw snow, I was in residence with a whole bunch of other kids. So we're like, we're 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. Right. And we're all just hanging out in a room. There's like nine, 10 of us, Mexicans, Iranians, kids from the Caribbean, maybe one Canadian. It's a whole mix of boarding school kids, just boys. And uh, well, we had the guy residence, girl residence, irrelevant story. And one of us looks outside and we're like, yo, is, is that snow? No one's seen snow before. So we all just book it right outside. Mind you, we're, we're still in our underwear boxers. We're very comfortable and we're just booking it outside. And that excitement probably lasts about 45 seconds as we, as we take it all in. It's settling down on the field around us. And then the cold kicks in. <laughs> we're like, we're not entirely prepared for this. So we book it right back inside. So that was the first time we saw snow, which was kind of cool. <laughs> Uh, you said you were going to mention about your first yeah. Christmas with snow. Christmas, yeah. So I like to tease my friends here that I've always had white Christmases. And before this year, so 2020, I was actually fortunate enough to go home for every Christmas. And I would spend it on the beach. And that was a white sandy Christmas, right? And a lot of the times it wasn't actually snowing here. So I would tease them. I got the white Christmas. You didn't. I'm kind of kind of rude for that. Well, whatever. It's a little bit of a laughing matter. And this time I was actually here for my first Christmas um, for no particular reason, COVID, but it was beautiful. It snowed so much. So I still ended up getting my first white Christmas that I spent in Canada. I was going to mention earlier, at least I was thinking when you were talking about the 
the challenge and the emotional toll that the residency situation would have played on you of just not being able to to know or to plan or to forecast or really have any sort of sense of grounding maybe psychologically and emotionally prepared you a little bit for how to deal with this pandemic we've been in the last year. Have you noticed any of that? Absolutely. 100% yes. 100% yes. I, I, I don't know why I like to, I like to believe in the universe and it was in 2018 when I was going through this turmoil of having to deal with going home. So, so just 2018 is when I had to go home to St. Martin in February but in January, I started journaling. And that was me kind of like just try, trying to process what's next. How am I feeling even? And the first couple of entries I, I wrote, I don't know what to write. Just, I kept on coming across different sources saying, this is what you should probably be doing. And in doing so, I was able to get into a bit of a routine that compiled over time. It was, it was a compounding effect, essentially. And each of these little tasks that I was able to take in allowed me to prepare for the monster that COVID was um, because we had so much, so much going on last year um, in terms of where I'm, I'm currently living. I actually moved into where we're working. So all of the preparation, if you, if you will, that I did personally before COVID hit led me to, to feel like we're thriving, if you will. How has it been for you with family back in St. Martin? to be separated this it's one thing to be living in a different part of the world, but knowing you can hop on a plane and, and go back. It's another entirely, I would imagine where it's not as, as immediately accessible as that to just hop on a plane and to also know that there is this threat um, possibly affecting the people that you love. How's that been? It's, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, we have, I have my Canadian friends here and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to see my parents, but we're still going to socially distance and that's cool. It's, you're still get, getting to visit. It's not the same. And I hear their complaints and I understand because like physical contact and, and really settling into a household is different than socially distancing. distancing. But at this point, I am, I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to say like I'm proud of this, but I am used to just not being there. Um, I left home when I was 15. So pretty much half of my life now has been a relationship like this virtually. Um, it is unfortunate that it has been this long. It hasn't been this long of a period that I haven't been home, but at the same time, it could be three years. It could be five years that I don't go home. Um, just to put it in perspective, I don't foresee that happening, but the fact that we're able to communicate like this, I can't really I don't really find any, any reason to complain, um, but it is not the best situation. What's the situation with COVID been like back in St. Martin for your parents? They, it's a, it's a very small population and the entire industry relies on tourism. So when they shut down, it's, it's not only their livelihood for the COVID period, because they're also playing around with, hurricane season and tourism season so during the summer months they don't usually get a lot of traffic so they're kind of used to that but having COVID extend over the winter months the economic situation is is unraveling and I don't want to say the turmoil is growing on the island because I'm not fully there but they're seeing that a lot of people are are very much stressed my parents are in in a comfortable position, so I'm happy. I'm happy for that. But the island as a whole is suffering as well, and it's not just COVID for them because a lot of these smaller countries, St. Martin in particular, um, but other other countries that get hit by hurricanes are actually still recovering from those effects three years ago. I think it is. Um, we had Irma in 2017. Don't quote me on that, but the island's infrastructure still hasn't popped up from that. So even since then, the tourism has been hurting. So it's, 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 it's very slow moving. It's on Caribbean time and not a fun way. It's, it's interesting um, on a number of different levels. Um, 
the challenges that, that face all of us around the world, but then also the unique challenges that many of us had that have been exacerbated, as, as you had mentioned. Um, I hope that your, your parents are well and that the, the people of the, the island uh, find a way through as, as well. Let's, let's maybe move away from that line of, of discussion and sort of back onto the Louis Engel path where Louis now Engel. you're, <laughs> you're, um, you're writing rap music you're digging that vibe a little bit. You're mm-hmm. picking up some of the tutorials online. <laughs> I love so much of what I'm hearing. Where did what we now know as the Go Produce podcast come into play? Yes. So, so rewind to the 30 day challenge. I had a knee surgery. I had two knee surgeries between this period. So, September 2019, up until now, I'm about a year and a half out of knee surgeries. Um, so my mom actually came up to Canada to help me out for the first knee surgery. And I ended up reciting some of the raps to her and she saw a light spark up in me. Um, I guess. And she says, Hey, you should probably call studios or try and find work in this field because the motivational speaking isn't going so well for you. (laughs) I was like, ma, leave me alone. Um, but she wasn't wrong. (laughs) <laughs> and here I am sitting on a couch four weeks after, or sorry, two and a half weeks after surgery, making phone calls to different studios around the city of London. And a couple answered me and then only one answered my follow-up. Um, and I ended up having an interview with them two months later. So, so the initial phone call was, hey, I want to become a rapper. I have no idea what to do. I need experience. And I also want to do a podcast around personal development because I think people are interesting. And they said, all right, cool. You sound cool. Let's just, uh, let's talk more. And so they threw me on the spot when I came in, they're like, Hey, we want to hear a rap. I almost shattered, but those are the kinds of times that you have to stand up and and like do what you got to do. So I did it and they're like, Oh, you know, not bad. So my circle expanded a little bit more and I got a little bit more positive reinforcement. And so we started working a little bit more closely together and because I, I still wanted to do the podcast, I was, I had a lot of underground work done in terms of the direction steps, certain steps that we needed to do. And now I was trying to integrate them into that project because I don't know video and audio nearly as well as they do. I was just trying to be like the fun personality and project manager, if you will. And as we were talking, they're like, well, if you want to be a rapper and you want to do a podcast and we're a music studio, why don't we make the podcast around music? This, that's brilliant. <laughs> so that's how the idea of Go Produce was born. Um, we, we started talking about how can we actually bring value to the people that we're speaking to, how we can bring value to the people we want to talk to. And then we executed on it. And no word of a lie. Last week, I had a little bit of a breakdown. I said, I have too much going on. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. Maybe it's time to draw Go Produce to, to its end so I can focus more on my artistry and on the other um, initiative that we have here. And uh, after a short conversation with my, my, my roommate partner, we decided that it was not a good idea to wrap up and because we're going to be refining the process and we actually got some good, potentially good news. I don't want to spill too much of it, but it's potentially a, a, a large sponsor and it'll be our first. So that literally happened a couple of days after the minor breakdown. So Go Produce is doing well. It's, it's been quite interesting, but it was established so that I can make as many connections and learn as much as I can about the music industry so that I can apply it to myself and the artists that I interact with so that we can, we can share our music with our communities. <laughs> You've got big brass ones, Louis. I, <laughs> I love it. Love you it. just keep... Um, it must, maybe it comes from jumping off those cliffs into the water back at home, <laughs> uh, not knowing yes. what creatures lurk below and going in there anyway. I don't know, but you're doing a lot of the things that would be very high up on a lot of people's lists of things that would terrify them most <laughs> speaking <laughs> in front of strangers, interviewing other people, reaching out to people that you don't know, cold, looking for an opportunity, 
being put on the spot. Okay, let me hear what you've got. And, and responding to that moment, uh, taking your own ideas and creativity and sharing them with people, which is, I think, one of the most vulnerable things that we can do because Oof. there's a real, I believe, Louis, a real uh, personal, well, vulnerability, I guess, is the word that I'll go back to that, that, that bleeds out of us any of us that that create something yeah. new yeah the very act of of bringing it into being is is a really beautiful and i think highly personal thing to share that with someone else is to invite the opportunity that they're going to rip it to shreds or or not understand of course you also can get those moments that you have described where people see the the potential if not just the spark that that is emitting from you and and that's really rewarding yeah. but but you got you've got to be prepared for the downs as well as the ups don't you yes those are very real and this that's very i like how you say you got to make yourself vulnerable because i don't often to open stages tell people like yeah i had a hard time with this and this and this because no one really talks about that, but it's, it's important for people to realize that at every stage, you're going to have hardship, no matter what you're doing. I, and I don't want people to be like down the road. Oh yeah. He got lucky because this and this happened for him. That's a whole lot of nonsense. Like you're doing the work and it sucks. It sucks sometimes, but it's also grand sometimes. So it's, it's a balance. So here you are now found your way into this podcast it doesn't sound like you've ever hosted a podcast before or had really any experience interviewing people or music. <laughs> so, uh, so what's that first interview or the first few interviews like going into it? Oh, first couple of interviews. Well, it starts with not eating until the interview is over because the stomach is tied. It's tied. Um, I have the outline prepared. I have my research done. So like I'm confident in terms of my talking ability and, and my ability to, to listen. I, I, I truly pride myself on that. Um, however, the music knowledge was, it wasn't z like zip. It was YouTube acquired. I, I watch YouTube videos. I take notes and I ask these guys questions. These guys being the studio people around me. Um, but what is cool with our podcast specifically is that as we're online, I have one of the team members, one of the, the, the studio managers sitting on the call, but like off the screen. And he's also listening into the conversation and through a different means of communication, he's sending me different kinds of cues to also walk the conversation in a specific direction if I have no idea what's going on. So it's a very delicate situation. And, 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 uh, we definitely have run into issues before. It's like, no, I, I, I already asked that. Wait, did I? And so we cut that stuff out, but we try and make it as seamless as possible. And the cool thing is the more that we do it, the more that I actually understand um, and I'm, I'm able to carry the conversation myself. So what I really wanted to show with the other listeners that would, if they're following from the beginning, they would see that not only am I becoming a better podcast and, and podcaster and show host, but I'm actually learning about the material from scratch to where I'll be touring internationally. Like this is, it's, this is the, the, the steps that I took. So it's laid out for them as well. What are some of the conversations maybe that immediately pop to mind that, that have really stood out as being particularly memorable for you so far? Meaning, podcast episodes right right um oof. okay a couple of moments right off the top of my head i was speaking to a a uh, publicist his name is dalton higgins he is super brilliant he does he he's an author he he works with countless major major artists and and when i first discovered him i almost felt like we had a little bit of a connection almost like he could be my, my uncle if I was able to choose my uncles for like a mentor kind of situation. Um, and something that he responded with, because he's, he's done countless interviews and he's interviewed lots of people as well. So I actually asked him, 
what was the most memorable conversation you had? I, I framed the same question to him and he responded, Con any conversation with my wife. And that was totally not related to music, but one of the big focuses around Go Produce is how do you turn your passion into profit? And I don't wanna say profit is the dollar bill, it is one form of profit, but there are so many other ways that you can, you can benefit from this line of work. And one way that he benefited and he truly profited is through the relationship that he was able to find through his work in his wife. Um, so that stuck out, which is kind of cool. Um, and then also another common theme, not a, sp a particular example, but a common theme or thread that I'm seeing throughout every episode is people have mentors to some degree, one in, in any shape or form. So without a mentor, without going out of your way and asking someone for their help, it's going to be a lot more challenging. It'll, it'll take you a lot longer. Maybe you want that challenge, that pride to say you did it all by yourself. But mentors are a common theme. I would, I would recommend that. What have you found out about yourself through this process? Ooh. In terms of actually interviewing, I... I I am now able to see people through a different lens. I was a little bit, like I started, like I, like I said earlier, I was nervous when I would speak to the people at the beginning. And after season two, throughout season three, I would still get, you know, the butterflies ahead of time, but I was still e like, I was eating now. I was getting a full night of sleep. I was, I was okay with all of that. <laughs> it wasn't so painful anymore. Um, and then you would see yourself on the camera, your, your body language changes. You're not so like, uptight looking at everything so alert you're just there you're just being um, so the actual awareness of what you can do in such a short period of time really really brought my attention to okay what else do I want to do and how can I do it as efficiently as possible while still understanding at least 80 percent of the elements so that I can get to the next goal um, and it's just a matter of refining the process every so often. It constantly feels like you're, you're always building, but like a city is usually always under construction. So it's, it, if you want that, then that's, that's what you got to do. I've seen the, the, the term prevail media group uh, yeah. associated directly with, with Go Produce. Um, what can you tell me to help me understand how those things go together? All right. So prevail media group is the, entity that houses all that we're working on essentially. Um, Big Lou Crew is, is my own brand, but like we have a facility here, the studio, there's the, the, the booth, recording area, rehearsing space, all of that, whatnot. And that's actually where we record Go Produce. So Prevail houses and owns Go Produced. I called Prevail um, way back when, and I, I set it all up and I came in as an intern and within a year, I was able to prove valuable and I went from intern to director. So now I contribute to a lot more of the different kinds of conversations. And that was almost my entrance. So Go Produce is my baby, but it's, it's, it's supported by Prevail. Um, Prevail also houses studio operations and another relatively new initiative that we kind of rebranded. We've been doing work with this, or I should say they've been doing work with this previously but we spent the past eight months now rebranding and revamping a new concept. It's called Envision Concepts. And that's where we do content creation work for different brands uh, and brands and companies, not necessarily just locally. We are doing local work, but we, we are actually doing international work, which is quite fascinating since we just did our rebrand launch six weeks ago. Woo, six weeks. Anyway, so that's been good. It's been a handful. Um, and actually, because that was picking up, that's almost the reason where, where I thought Go Produce should kind of fade out because I was worried that the two would clash, um, especially with my artistry. Um, but Prevail houses those entities. Envision, Go Produce, the studio operations. Yeah, that's Prevail. It's pretty neat. There are a lot of different um, facets a lot of different plates that you're trying to keep spinning. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bizarre. Yeah. But I get the sense that you're the kind of person who thrives on that. 
Am I wrong? I, I, I wouldn't say you're wrong. I would say that I'm probably obsessive. Um, but I do, I do, I do want to place a very strong, heavy emphasis on health. Um, I spend a lot of time like in the gym, stretching, working out, breathing, sleeping, um, meditating, personal development, all of that. I, I do highly want to stress is very important because without that, I wouldn't be able to, to, to be navigating how I am. Um, but at the same time, I'm not doing anything else. Like COVID is nice because, oh yeah, you can't go and see your friends. But if it weren't COVID, I'm still not going out. Like I wasn't going out before COVID and until, until it's time, this is what I like. You have to, you have to be able to be comfortable in a room by yourself if you're trying to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you, I'm sure you know that like you've put a lot. Well, of yeah. Doing. I, well, I can, I can relate to both sides of that. Sure. Um, on one hand, weeks feel like they can go by with the, uh, the the work that that I do on things like this podcast and creating my own videos. I also do a lot of work through NSM Brand Media with creating content and and, and helping out with social media marketing for other companies. And it can it, you can just get lost in that. Um, but on the other hand, I was also running a a monthly event series that we had going really, really well after a couple of years and was doing a lot of paid speaking engagements and workshops and conferences and all of that just got wiped off the map. So it's been an interesting time to, uh, we were talking about knowing when to let go of some things, even if it's just letting go for now and to, to see where your, um, where your heart lies. And, and, and and even if, if your heart lies in a, a place where that's just not available to you right now, like for me, the speaking yeah. was what I've been most passionate about, what I'm best at, and what I enjoy the most. Um, but I don't enjoy it over Zoom, Louie. I don't. I've oh, done a few. Brutal. Yeah, I've done a few workshops um, virtually, and I think I would say I'm good at them, and I've I've had really good feedback. But I just don't. I'm like, eh. Without the vibe of being together with people in the room, I think I'd rather just invest that time doing something else. You yes, know what? I agree. Um, to each their own, but I, I'm get, get, getting the feeling like you and I are similar in that um, we like to be stimulated by different things. And there are times when I'll admit that I, I wished I were more the kind of person that said, well, just give me this and I'm going to hammer that same nail over and over and over and over. And then at the yeah. end of the day, I'll punch out and then I'll just go relax. But I'm just not way. wired that way. And I don't think you are either. No, no. It's that's I mean, I I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't so much factory work, um, but even when I was in the pharmaceutical industry, I was going insane. Like I, the fact that I had to be somewhere for eight hours of a day, regardless of the work was done or not, just because didn't compute to me. <laughs> just no, no, let's not do this. And I, I actually I, I, I said that I, I do spend a lot of time with health. But that point in time, I was gaining weight. I was probably 35 pounds heavier than I am now. Um, I just, I would finish work, get home at like 435 and then watch TV because I was accomplished. I did, I did, I like, I worked for the day. Um, so that's insane. I can't, I can't do that. And p- people do it. That's great. If they're happy, be, do it. I, it didn't make me happy. Yeah. Like I said, there, there are times where I, I wish I was more like that. Yes. Well, I am a this, I go and do that. And then I clock out and then enjoy the rest of my life. I could make a real just go on. solid case for that. Yes. Um, but I've never been able to get that to work for me. Um, you've mentioned personal development a couple of different times. I'm interested about where that whole idea kind of entered your path. As you've talked about prioritizing health, you've mentioned meditation, you've talked about the importance of getting proper sleep. And maybe I'm interested in this, Louis, because it's not something I ever really investigated until my life and career and health, both mental and physical, fell apart when I was in my late 30s. So what was it for you that that, that brought you onto that path of just learning and growing and what we'll loosely call personal development? Yeah, it was, I'd, I'd say... I don't want to speak so horribly about the, the time at the pharmaceutical ex- industry, um, but I wasn't happy then. And mm. I was exploring 
why I was feeling like this. I, like, I, I remember driving home and this one car just cutting me off, not horribly, but just like doing it. And I just lost all my cool. And as I'm doing that, I'm like, why am I, why am I getting so upset? It's Friday afternoon. I'm going home. I'm going to get home. <laughs> like, why, why, am I, why am I mad? And that stuck with me. Um, mm. I, I, I began to spend some time sitting at that desk doing nothing for hours, um, reading like, how can I change something? Um, and it just began with reading, reading small different kinds of tidbits of books. And uh, I don't know why, but as I started reading a little bit more, I didn't necessarily start reading books, keep that in mind. I was reading just different articles. How can I change my situation? What can I do to be different? Very, very basic questions that are also very abstract, if you will. Um, and in this exploration, I told my friend um, that I was reading and he says, hey, I've got this book that I think you will, you'll vibe with. I was like, all right, cool, let's give it a go. Um, I haven't really read a full book through other than Harry Potter. Shout out to Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I've read them all too. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of actual reading, like I was never considered myself to be a reader. And um, it was a spiritual book. Oh, I wish I could tell you the, the name of it right now. Anyway, the author has a version of it for the masculine energy and then for the feminine energy. And I read the masculine energy first which was recommended to me. And I was just completely consumed by it um, in terms of how we're actually supposed to be communicating as individuals synergistically as one. Um, and it goes beyond like you're a man, so you have to be masculine. It's not that it's your aura, your persona and how you, how you share yourself with other people. And so I, I got more into um, self-awareness essentially of that energy. And from there, I, I kind of went down a rabbit hole. Um, I started looking at different hallucinogens. I started looking at different binaural beats, different kinds of therapies that you can use to accelerate this process and increase your perspective. Because to me, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. We can be standing in the same room watching the same thing and interpret it, inter and, and interpret it entirely differently. So I wanted to explore different perspectives. And the fastest way to do that, I thought was through reading more and through consuming the right kind of information, which meant not as much reality TV, not as much news, that kind of stuff. So it just became, it became one after the other. I challenged myself with little things. The rap 30 day rap challenge was one of the like later challenges, but I had smaller challenges that I did as well. And it was just those small wins. Once you realize you can do those small wins that you're committed to yourself, it, you can realize that you can commit to other people. And then people realize, oh, this person can actually commit to me. And then more starts to happen. I hope those who are watching and listening paid close attention to what you just said, Louis, because that was, was really well said. And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so anyone who was maybe at that point or familiar with what you described that feeling of when that car cut you off and where you just realized you were kind of disconnected from yourself and going like, wait, 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 wait a second. What the hell? Like what? <laughs> yeah. Is this how yeah. I want to feel? Is this, um, I hope that, that they'll listen back to what you said. Um, because it really is amazing how some of the things that we're just doing by routine, we're just, when we wake up and we automatically start reliving the past and we're not yeah. even aware of it. And you mentioned things like the news and reality TV. Isn't it funny how those things just sort of, they go from being habitual parts of what you do and who you think you are to they just sort of fall away and you get down the path a certain point and kind of wake up and go, gee, like <laughs> I've got different people around me and I'm doing different things and I'm investing my time and, in, in, in different ways than I ever had. How did I ever have the time to watch all this TV? I don't, I'm not condemning TV, but I think you know what you I know, mean. Yeah. That you just you 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 just keep taking those little steps to move forward. I love that phrase. I don't know who it was originally attributed to, but the idea of that we 
uh, we tend to really overestimate the amount of things that we can get done in a sh- short period of time, but we underestimate the amount of things that we can do over a long period of time, which is yeah. why those little steps really add up, huh? 100%, 100%. And I also like in terms of time, um, 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 I want to share that. Are you familiar with Parkinson's law? Refresh my memory. Okay, so Parkinson's law is a theory or a principle or a law <laughs> that states... <laughs> <laughs> Which is it, man? Yeah, probably, that's funny. Probably a little law. <laughs> uh, but it states that um, a task will expand to the amount of time that is allotted for it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So essentially ties into your SMART goals. Pick the goal, make sure that it's measurable, and then ultimately choose a time as to when it will be done. Um, it doesn't always go that way, but it's kind of interesting. And um, um, I would definitely try using it if that's if it's something that interests you. That's uh, yeah, I've heard that. I didn't realize that was Parkinson's uh, principle slash law, <laughs> but I have yeah. heard that. And I have found that to be true as well. Um, here's one I heard just the other day. I was watching a, a video that was a compilation of, of some bits of motivational talks by Simon Sinek, the guy who wrote start Ooh, with why. Brilliant man. Yeah. And what jumped out of that video for me was he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but the difference between a, a vision and goals uh, is a finish line. The goals have a, a finish line and, and they, they're they like stepping stones on the way to your vision, which is always expanding and never done. And, and this speaks to something that you talked about earlier about just growth and how it's just that finish line's always moving further away. And that's just expansion. That's our, our nature. Um. Yeah. But that's neat too, right? Because now you can look back and you can see the different finish lines that you have crossed, that you've challenged yourself to certain goals that you've achieved, and yet you still find yourself reaching toward this larger vision. Yeah, yeah, it's bonkers. And a lot of those goals, I mean, I like to, I like, I'm an advocate for planning ahead of time, but a lot of those girl, goals will just pop up as you're moving forward. Yeah. There's, there's no way you can foresee everything that's going to happen. And, and, it's not until hindsight that you can actually truly reflect on it. So just do literally just do. Yeah. You got to be ready to jump. Like when you call up the studio and they say, sure, come on in. And they go, let's hear some rap. And you're like, <laughs> what? I wrote this two weeks ago. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> but that's, isn't that when you look back on that, I mean, when you're in those moments, they, they happen so quickly that if you can, find yourself really present inside them that's the like the greatest gift that's the real juice but yep looking back and reflecting on those moments is like rocket fuel for the time that you need to push yourself toward the next challenge yep so true so true if you don't if you don't reflect um there's no way that you can become aware of these different situations so the more that you reflect once you actually find yourself in this situation, you're like, yo, this is it. This is, ha- this is happening right now. Let me really take this in. Let me hone it. Mm-hmm. And you, you won't realize that unless you're actively reflecting. Yeah, that visualization. Do you find that you're able to do that, Louis? Where um, recently I've been reading a lot of Joe Dispenza's work. Oh, and very nice. I really like it about how he talks about not just visualizing, but, but like literally getting into the feeling place of an elevated emotion of, yeah. um, and when I think about that and I realize that the things that I have been able to like goals that, it, that I have been at one point or another off in the future for me, that I've been able to sort of see like a, like a movie in my mind that I can actually see myself in it. Yep. Um, I can't think of a time where I've, I've had that where it hasn't actually come to be like you just described. Oh, wow. Have you experienced that too? I'm still relatively new to the whole visualization. I, I started probably two and a half years ago. Um, so I, I still think that's relatively new. I don't know how long you've been practicing it. So as, as, as a result of me starting doing this, yes, I wholeheartedly say this is true. This is real. Visualization is not a joke. Um, I have a couple of vision boards and that will react obviously optically stimuli. So I'm seeing myself, but then it takes it to the next level where you take that image and you fully embody yourself. What does it smell like? What does my environment smell like sound like? Who are the people standing next to me? And, and these things actually come into fruition. It's so, so bizarre. 
Um, an example of it actually working for me um, in a short term period was me putting a, uh, a studio, a recording studio on a vision board, a house with one. And no word of a lie, eight months later, I moved into this house. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a total advocate for it. Um, my, I, I was introduced through, to visualization through John Asaraf. He also does the, the binaural beats that I was talking about earlier. Um, but this is absolutely a game changer and people can say I'm crazy. They can say whatever they want, but I'm a visualized to the day I die. <laughs> That's so funny. John's a mentor of mine. I, I did his uh, winning the game of money and having it okay. all programs and was yeah. part of his neurogym achievers group for a couple of years. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, funny how we, we connect with, with each other uh, and have similar interests. Talking about vision and, and goals, uh, it sounds like the through line here through all of this is that you you have remained steadfast in that vision about being an international recording artist and back to where we started about the Big Lou crew of you making happy rap music. Uh, is that still the big vision for you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to maintain my happiness um, and I want to help other people find their happiness. I can't make them happy. Um, but I also don't want to go to the point where I'm over exhausting myself and causing harm to myself um, and to those people directly around me. Um, cause, cause I really do cherish those relationships, but assuming I keep that in check, the goal is to grow the podcast so that we become the most influential music business podcast in Canada, at least for now. Um, and then use that to, to grow a lot of strategic relationships, build a lot of fun, personable relationships as well, help a lot of other artists in, in, in a similar environments to me, um, and then use that to promote my artistry so I can reach the right people um, with my approaches. Well, I'm down, Louis. Like the way that you described <laughs> the, the, the happy rap at the beginning of our conversation, I'm like, let's, you know... <laughs> Let's let's have it. Um, let's have so, it. Yeah. So, and I'm sure you're interested um, far more than I to to bring it to life. But please do circle back around with me when when some of that starts to come into Absolutely. being, so that we can uh, help get the word out and, and share and celebrate what you're doing. For now, what are some of the ways that people can find you and connect with you and and find the the, the podcast and and just stay in touch. Be a Absolutely. part of the Big Lou crew. The Big Lou crew. It's a grand time, I promise you. Um, but the best ways to connect me immediately would be through Instagram. That's at Big Lou Crew, B-I-G-L-O-U-C-R-E-W. And I'm, I'm pretty much there constantly. You can find me at my website as well, BigLouCrew.com. I've got a little bit of different overviews of my projects. I'm going to be updating that, but there. If you are interested in learning more and keeping up to date, I, I do have a monthly mailing list. I only send you one email. It's very fun, inspiring. If you thought I inspired you here, I put some effort into there. So it's fan, it's fan, fantastic. Um, but those would be the two best places to reach me fastest. If you're interested in the podcast, go.produce, at go.produce on Instagram or goproduce.ca. That's, I guess that's my reel. Okay. Are there certain um, channels that people can uh, listen to or, or watch previous episodes that they can just subscribe to it? Yeah, absolutely. So we, if, it, if you search on YouTube, it's Go Produce Podcasts. It's also on Buzzsprout, Spotify, all of those channels, Apple Podcasts, the main ones and the not so main ones. But Go Produce Podcast, Prevail Media Group. If you just search Go Produce Podcast, it will show up. Um, my persona on it is Big Lou. It's not Louis Engel, um, so don't be confused by that, but that's my artist persona. That's my, my stage name, and uh, <laughs> that's how you'll find us there. <laughs> I love it. I, I really appreciate you investing this time, Louis. It's, it's cool to connect with you, and I'm, I'm here as a cheerleader and a supporter and encourager for the rest of the journey. Um, Fantastic. I think you've shared a lot, and I thank you for that. Uh, that. That will really be a help to anybody who hears it because uh, – 
I think it's so easy for us to judge ourselves and think everybody else has it figured out. And you look at somebody and they think, oh, they've got a podcast and they've got this and that, and they have, a, they have no idea what the story is and what it's taken uh, for you to get to where, where you are. And uh, I appreciate you sharing. I think it's important. And that's why I do this. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Even after all I shared, I, I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> if you ever get it figured out, please write the book and sign one yeah. for me, would you? Because uh, I'm not even pretending anymore. Yeah. In fact, I just put a, a video out today on my TikTok channel that said um, basically that I wish I'd known sooner that none of us really know what we're doing. It's just that some of us are better actors than others. I saw that one. I saw you share that one. Yes. <laughs> it's and true, I though. wish I'd known that 40 years earlier, Louie. It's true. But it's uh, true. With good company, we can at least have a lot of fun while we're trying to stumble our, uh, our way uh, forward e uh, either way. But thank you again for this time, Louie. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I hope we can do it again. Most definitely. It was an honor. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. That's Louis Engel, the project manager and show host of the Go Produce podcast. So go and find that on any of the, the, the ways that he mentioned and also connect with him at BigLouCrew.com. I want to hear some of that happy rap music. Keep in mind, this is episode 120 of Journeys with the No Schedule Man. So all of the links that Louis just mentioned, I'll make sure that I put in the show notes blog post for this episode number 120. You'll be able to find it at noschedulemancom or the channels similar to what Louis just mentioned about Go Produce. You can also find Journeys with the No Schedule Man on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, blah, blah, bling, bling. And blah. And while you're there, if you enjoy it, please take a moment to follow it, maybe even rate and review it if you're maybe on Apple Podcasts, because that helps us reach more people with stories like Louis, so that hopefully we can help them and inspire them to go forward on their own journey. I want to say thank you to Mulligan Realty Group for their support of Journeys with the No Schedule Man, Ryan and his team, the kind of realtor that you deserve. You can find out more about them at mulliganrealtygroup.com. Thanks also to Brett and the great people at Provincial Glass and Mirror here in London, Ontario, Canada. You can learn more about what they do at ProvincialGlass.com. My online coaching membership service is called My Real Success Pass. If you have any interest in being able to interact with me on regular live calls and complete access to the recording library of, of all of the coaching sessions that we've done on Living and Working Happy, you can do that by visiting MyRealSuccess.ca and NSM Brand Media is the company that I'm the president of, which helps small to mid-sized businesses with social media marketing and, and custom content creation uh, in a way that we feel is fairly unique. You can find out more about that at YourSocialSalesRep.com. Most of all, I want to thank you for investing this time with myself and with Louis, and most of all, in yourself. I hope you've taken away something valuable from it and can be inspired and motivated by Louis's story. On behalf of Louis Engel, my name is Kevin Bulmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Much love. <laughs>